Hello, welcome to this time of worship with Gorgie Do Rye Stenhouse Church. In our reflection today, led by our local minister, Moira Taylor Winterskill, we're looking at messengers and their message. And speaking of messages, Moira's thought for the day each weekday morning at 10 o'clock continues on our Facebook page. There's also a short reflection in the evening for the close of the day at 10 p.m. or thereabouts. Moira also has a virtual vestry hour at 12 o'clock on Wednesdays at lunchtime. If you have any pastoral issues you'd like to discuss, or if you'd just like a chat, she'd be delighted to see you. And as we said last week, although our minister, Peter Barber, is still on sick leave, it's been lovely to see him across the Zoom screen as we join together for a coffee time on Sundays at 12 midday. Please join in if you can. And now Moira will lead us in worship. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you again this morning as we join together in our service of worship. Um, my name is Moira Taylor Winterskill and I am the local minister here at Gorgie Del Ryan Stainhouse. Wherever you are um, and whatever time you're watching this, I hope that you feel God's presence within you and around you. And let's just bring ourselves firmly into God's presence now as we listen to our call to worship. We open our hearts to receive God's welcome. We open our hands to greet one another. We open our lives to God's invitation to live in love and freedom. And now we'll have our first hymn um, with Norda. Let 
us pray. God of all life and love, we thank you that we may welcome each new day with joy and celebration, that we may live the entire day in the glow of your love. Help us, Lord, to share that love, to trust in it and to live within it. Father God, when we make mistakes, we know that you're there to correct us and set us back on the right path, and that you do so with compassion and understanding. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, that Jesus stood in our place to take away our sins. We offer our thanks for the message he brought, the example he gave, and the lessons he offered. In this time of speedy, instant communication, when there is a wide range of methods through which we can contact each other, we sometimes hear your words without listening. We don't recognize the precious gift you're giving us. Lord Jesus, you are the greatest communicator of all time, with the greatest message of salvation ever shared. Lord God, when we feel overwhelmed with the news, data and information all around us, help us to sift out what is important. All of us are guilty of ignoring some messages and regretting it, even if only the message which says wet paint or the plate is hot, we can't resist testing it for ourselves, resulting in messy or burnt fingers. In recent years, we've taken a new phrase into our everyday speech, that of fake news. Lord, may we never be afraid to share the true good news of the gospel. We offer our gratitude that time was taken to write down the stories Jesus told, his teaching, his preaching, and the day-to-day -day account of his time here on earth. God of all faithfulness, we thank you that you are there beside us throughout all the ups and downs of our lives. Whenever we feel lost or alone, you are there to comfort us, to help us to remember that nothing can separate us from your love. May we echo the prayer of Mary Slessor. Gracious God, I put everything in your hands. I lay everything on your altar. I take nothing back and I yield all things to your glory. Please join me now as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. And now Henry will bring us today's readings. First lesson for today is taken from Genesis, chapter 4, verses 1 through to 10. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out of the field. Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? 
I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The second lesson is taken from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through to 23. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. And now we'll hear from Bettina. Good morning. This is our second week of our family's theme of people that do important jobs that mean even more to us than usual during this second pandemic year. I have a pile of things to show you today. I wonder if this is going to help you guess who or what I might be talking about. On the top of the pile, I have a postcard. It's a save the date invitation to someone's wedding. Hopefully that will happen this year. The next one is a really stiff envelope that says, please do not bend on it. And I still haven't learnt how to turn my camera around so that it makes sense. That had another card inside it for a special occasion that I had to order online because I couldn't get to a special card shop. I've got a parcel ready to send to the post. That's got some friendly thinking of you things in it and some games for somebody that I know to cheer them up. This big one here had an advent calendar in it that came at Christmas. And that was a real surprise. It was from a friend that I hadn't seen for a really long time. Have you guessed? We're thinking about post people and delivery people at the moment this week. Those things that came in the post all meant something special. Some of it's exciting, some of it's important. All of those things came to me, or I can send to the post, to keep in touch with people. Those people that help it happen at the moment mean that we can not be so lonely. It means we can feel okay about ourselves. It also means that the important information that we need still gets where we're going. All of those things, I think, were in the story that Henry just read. I hope that this week we can all think about the people that we love and we can't see, all the important things we need to do that we might put them in the post, we might answer letters, we might be asking for a delivery of things that we can't get while we have to stay at home at the moment. So the people that keep all of those things going are even more precious and important to us at the moment. 
Henry read to us from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the people that lived in Ephesus. Paul wrote letters, long letters full of encouragement, information, how to live together as people, but all about Jesus and how people could be friends with him and with each other. We actually heard quite a lot about that during the summer. When he'd written his great long letters, he needed to safely get it to where it was going. So that's where Tychicus came in in this reading. Tychicus was a delivery person, a postman, a human messenger. And he had a really important task. He had to keep himself and the letter safe all the way to Ephesus. He would have had to have kept it warm and dry, not lose it or squash it or bend it. Tychicus would have had to walk for maybe three days and then get a boat for maybe the same three days more to where he was going. I expect when he got there, he was very relieved and happy to have done his task. And I expect the people that received the letter were delighted and maybe took good care of Tychicus for doing that job. At the moment, the people that deliver our letters and post in deliveries, we hope that they are staying safe too. Most of us are staying home as much as we can to keep safe and to keep everyone else safe. But the people doing the delivery jobs, they still have to do their work. So they have to be extra specially careful to keep safe so that nothing happens to them and their post either. So this week, if I get letters or parcels through my door or when I take my parcel to the post later, I'm going to be especially thankful and say a grateful prayer for the people that are keeping us connected and doing those jobs. Have a good week. Tychicus who Paul refers to in our reading from Ephesians, is one of these Bible characters about whom we know very little. What we do know is that he is a dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord. And Paul knows him well and trusts him to be loyal and encouraging. God uses faithful messengers. In one way or another, he asks us all, to carry his message of good news. I spent a very long time discerning that God was calling me to ministry of word and sacrament, to be his messenger. I understand and appreciate that unlike many in the past, and many today who live in areas where Christians are persecuted, I am extremely blessed to be free and at liberty to share whatever message he asks me to share, without personal danger. Paul is writing his letter from prison, so he must trust Tychicus to carry the message in his stead. Part of this message is asking the Ephesians to don the armour of God, to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It's because of this challenge that I find myself sharing with you the message that I felt called to share at New College on Thursday. It's about how we, as followers of Jesus, respond to violence in our communities and in our world. I took a funeral on Monday and at the end I was chatting with the undertaker and crematorium staff who were talking about the large number of deaths by hanging they had dealt with in recent months. Young, beautiful people turning violence inwards because of hopelessness. That night I watched a programme which showed images of people brawling in supermarket aisles at the start of last year's lockdown over crisps and toilet rolls. I opened the browser on my laptop today to a headline which read Man charged with killing nine-week-old baby. Then there are the devastating ongoing conflicts and war like Afghanistan, Yemen, Palestine, Syria, Mexico, Turkey, Somalia, 
Algeria, Iraq, Libya. So many conflicts that don't even make the news much anymore. When I see and hear these things, the words of Bob Dylan ring in my ears. And how many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? Yes, and how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? Bob's answer, of course, is the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. But that doesn't set satisfy me. Unless, of course, the wind that he talks about is not one of despondency, but one of the Holy Spirit. As a Christian, I cannot shrug my shoulders and declare that violence is inevitable. I believe that those of us who are followers of Jesus need to seek a deeper understanding of the roots of violence. Media coverage is often shockingly shallow, hardly one that gets to these roots. It seems to me that most people have acquiesced to the inevitability of violence in our world, to the hope that law enforcement can do a better job. They keep their fingers crossed that legislation and tougher measures will do the trick. They hope that building more prisons will remove the problem. But all that deals with violence at its tipping point, not at its source. So what does the Bible say about violence? We don't get far into the biblical narrative before finding the first heinous act of violence. As Henry read earlier, in only the second generation of humanity, one brother spills the blood of another. Cain murders Abel for a reason that comes right from the heart, jealousy. The pattern is set. Something simple like jealousy left unchecked left to grow and deepen and intensify, leads to acting out in violence. God had warned Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. This is really an amazing statement. Jealousy leads to anger. And that sin is predatory, crouching at the door, looking to possess Cain. Violence, in other words, is often the tipping point after resentment turns to rage. What can be done about violence? God told Cain he had better master the pathology of his soul. He did not, and blood was spilled. God's response to Cain, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. And so does the blood of so many today. Violence does not begin with standing armies or generational ethnic hatred or long-standing social inequalities. Violence is the result of a pathology of the soul, as close to us as our own hearts. A bit later in Genesis, a profound principle is laid down regarding the moral wrongness of violence. In Genesis 9 verse 6, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. This is early in the biblical account. It's foundational. Most importantly, it links to the fundamental reality that violence against human beings is wrong because human beings were made in the image and likeness of God. There is a worth, a value, a dignity to every human life that makes selfish or wanton violence a moral offence. <clears throat> this is cemented by the teaching and example of Jesus in the New Testament. On the very night of his arrest, when violent men made their move on Jesus, he told Peter, who was ready to fight, put your sword back in its place, 
for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And this was a statement of principle consistent with all of Jesus' teachings. At his trial, he said to Pontius Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Some Christians, like the Mennonites and others in the Anabaptist tradition, see in Jesus' teaching nothing less than total pacifism. While others would say that Jesus' teaching does not preclude violence in defence or, as Romans 13 describes, an intentional punitive use of force in human governing. Romans 13.4 Rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. In either case, however, it is clear that Jesus' teaching elevates non-violence as a preferred response to violence. And the reason is the important part. Jesus introduced a different kind of kingdom and with it a different set of ethical standards. One of the most revolutionary of Jesus' teachings is that human violence begins in a deeper place. The sin of violence has already begun before blood is spilled or words wound. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You have heard it said, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. We cannot talk about murder without talking about rage. We cannot talk about brawling in shops, killing babies and conflicts that span decades without talking about the infections of hatred, malice, hurt, jealousy, inequality and anger in our culture. Consider again the Sermon on the Mount from Mark 7, 14 to 23. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. And here is the bad news of the human condition. Violence, like all sin, comes out of the human heart. I'm not saying that this statement of Jesus offers a complete psychology of violence, but there is a kernel of truth here that may serve us well as we look at the mystery of so much violence in our society. The Pharisees wanted to believe that sin was a matter of what people put in, like the food they ate. And that's a convenient way to look at life. Far more troubling, but true nonetheless, is that all people have within them the potential for violence. Jesus clearly taught that the world is a sinful and violent place, but he challenged his followers not to live in fear and trepidation. Matthew ten twenty eight, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. He also said in John 16 verse 33, I have told you all this so that you may find peace in me. In the world you will have trouble, but be brave. I have conquered the world. I think we must all ask ourselves, 
What is this bravery of which Jesus spoke? The kind of bravery that Christians working in dangerous parts of the world exercise every day. How can we take this to heart so that we do not live our lives cowering? Where would we turn in the scriptures for ways to deal with violence? What does Jesus want us to do about violence? What ought to leap to our minds is the Beatitudes, which includes this real life challenge. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. We must begin with a serious commitment to the principle, blessed are the peacemakers. But that won't happen unless we go beyond wishful thinking. John Lennon said, you may say I'm a dreamer. And that is often people's response to talk of peace. But peacemaking is far from daydreaming. Peacemaking is active work, hard work, frustrating work. It is not the convenient thing, but it is something that Jesus teaching calls all of his followers to do. Blessed are the blessed is what we'd like to believe, not blessed are those who expend their lives in the interest of reconciliation and compassion. This challenge is daunting, but it is Jesus' clear call for his followers in all time, and we must cling to it when we confront news of violence on a daily basis. Our entertainment industry fills our mind with violent images and lyrics. The formidable technology of war today takes on a life of its own. Many people are living a hair-trigger life, especially now in lockdown. Somehow the work of peacemakers needs to begin long, long before the fist hits the face or the bullets pierce the skin. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, The followers of Jesus have been called to peace. When he called them, they found their peace, for he is their peace. They are told that they must not only have peace, but make it. And to that end, they renounce all violence and tumult. John Stott, in his commentary on the Sermon of the Mount, says, now, peacemaking is divine work, for peace means reconciliation, and God is the author of peace and of reconciliation. What does peacemaking look like in practical terms? What can be done about violence? Another key New Testament passage that speaks about peacemaking is in the Epistle of James. He says, Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. There are many professionals whose work is peacemaking and we need to pray for them and support them. Human flourishing, safety and security in a community comes from a network of collaborators and that includes all of us. But we don't need to be vigilantes. We need to be vigilant. Followers of Jesus are called to do more than passively wait for the next person to lose the plot and lash out. Our Lord and Saviour commands us to close the gap with people rejected by others. To connect with the wounded before they lash out and wound others. To bring down the level of tension and stress around us by living with compassion and acceptance and intentional hospitality. It was said of Jesus in Matthew 12, 20, 
a bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. The next person in our community who may act out in violence is right now, today, somewhere, a bruised reed, a smouldering wick. Will we notice that person? Will we help that person back away from the edge of the cliff? Law enforcement officers cannot and should not supervise everybody's lives. Our laws define civil behaviour, but they cannot tame human personalities. Will we follow Jesus? Will we be made new in attitudes of our minds? Will we be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave us? Abel lay dead. Cain knew it because he did it. Genesis 4, 9 Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? That's the question for us. Are we our brother's keeper? Will we watch out for and love potential victims of violence? And will we have the courage to watch out for and love potential violent aggressors? Cain would not. Will we? Amen. I'm going to pass over now to um, my husband, Kerr Wintersgill, who's also um, a minister in training and he'll lead us in our um, prayers of intercession. Thank you Moira. Let us come together now in our prayers of intercession and I invite you to recall the people that have been brought to mind in the silences between the days. Let us pray. God our Saviour, we pray for those without hope that they hearing your good news, may be set free from their despair. We pray that the church will faithfully present the gospel in word and in action, so all may be saved. We pray for those with their hope dashed, feel bereft, abandoned and betrayed. We pray that the church will stand in solidarity with the suffering working for justice and peace. We pray for those who, beginning to hope, dare to dream that tomorrow might be different. We pray that the church will encourage and empower, teach and nurture them in faith. We pray for those who, working in hope towards a better future, face opposition We pray that the church will prefer to opt for them even to the extent of sacrificial giving. We pray for those who are at least enjoying some of life's fullness, who are full of thanks and hope. We pray that the church rejoicing with them may continue to seek justice and peace for all. We pray for those who are poor, sick, homeless, lonely, imprisoned, oppressed and powerless. May your love reach them and may the church stand with them so that all may come to give thanks to you and rejoice with one another. Amen.
Look back, not with regret at missed opportunities, but with thankfulness for what has been. Look forward, not with fear at what may or may not come, but with excitement at the possibilities, and be grateful for what is today. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and for evermore. Amen.